Well, good morning and good afternoon, good evening around the world. Glad to see everybody here live and in person. Uh, it's nice for a change. Uh, I guess I have to start by showing my disclosures, conflict of interest. Yes, I worked for Purina for a few years and even as a independent consultant, I still considered, considered to consult with them and was involved with some of the research that I'm going to be sharing with you. So we just had a wonderful overview of uh, mitral valve disease. Um, we know that uh, heart disease is a, a relatively common problem. Happen, happens in 10 to 15 percent of, of canine patients. It tends to be diagnosed more in older dogs. What's interesting, I think, is that despite this commonness to it, it may still be underdiagnosed. Um, there's, there's a little bit of evidence uh, from the Erfer paper that um, even in dogs that show no evidence of uh, mitral valve disease, that um, what they find, 27% that um, had mitral valve disease, even though there was absolutely no indication that they had it. So it is a common issue, but as was pointed out by Dr. Bonagura, um, it's something that for most dogs is asymptomatic for a long period of their life, often for their entire life. And yet there's about 30% of dogs with mitral valve disease that do go on to either develop heart failure or die as a result of cardiac disease. It was pointed out by our last speaker that the ACVIM consensus committee group has established guidelines for the diagnosis of mitral valve disease from stage A, which is totally asymptomatic and just really at risk for developing problems, to stage D, which is the, you know, no longer responsive to treatment. They also have provided, along with these diagnostic criteria, nutritional guidelines based on the stage of disease. So at stage A and stage B1, there's no guidelines given in terms of any kind of dietary modification. But at stage B2, they do recommend a mild restriction of sodium and also to start looking at calories and proteins to keep the dog in optimum body condition. Um, and also to look at a highly palatable diet to make sure that intake remains appropriate. As the disease progressive and they start to develop congestive heart failure, the suggestion is for somewhat more severe sodium restriction, um, but then to focus more on preventing cardiac cachexia and maintaining adequate calorie intake, maintaining protein intake, considering omega-3 fatty acids. So what I'm planning to do this morning is to talk about the evidence supporting those recommendations, but also to go beyond looking at other nutrients that I believe the evidence shows could be important in the management of heart disease. So we're gonna talk about sodium, yes. Omega-3 fatty acids, yes. Calories and protein, we're gonna look at what evidence there is, but then we're gonna look at other sources of energy, such as medium chain triglycerides. We're gonna look at magnesium, antioxidants, carnitine, and taurine, and look what the evidence shows if these nutrients might be of value in dogs with, with uh, mitral valve disease and heart failure. Before we get into such details, I want to remind everybody that the first primary most important goal of nutritional management of any and every patient is meeting the nutritional needs of the dog and cat. So that means complete and balanced nutrition. It means maintaining body weight and body condition and lean body mass, muscle mass. Once we get beyond that point, then we can think about altering the diet as needed to manage the clinical signs of the disease, to alter the diet to either maintain or enhance quality of life, and whenever possible, to slow or prevent progression of the disease. But meet the nutritional needs first and foremost. So the first nutrient that we're going to talk about is sodium. Why is sodium important? It's been the definitive nutrient in heart diets for decades. Why? 
So sodium is the primary osmotic agent in extracellular volume. Where sodium goes, water goes. Hence, it's the Pied Piper here with, sodium with water following along. Where sodium goes, water goes. So as the body takes in water, takes in sodium, um, it balances that through homeostatic mechanisms driven predominantly by the RAS system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. That's what we would expect, that's normal physiology. So just in a nutshell, basically you got low sodium intake that causes a decrease in arterial pressure, maybe a decrease in glomerular um, blood flow. That causes renin to be released, angiotensin to be activated, aldosterone to be increased, and that does what the body wants. Helps it to retain water, helps it to retain sodium, and of course also stimulates thirst, so we have water increase. So that's the normal balance. But as the heart fails, systemic blood pressure can drop because the, the, the heart's not pumping adequately. The body attempts to address this by stimulating the RAS system that can ultimately cause sodium retention, fluid overload, edema, and congestive heart failure. So we compensate by, of course, use of diuretics, but a low sodium diet. What's the evidence of a benefit to this? Well, there's a few studies in dogs that show that low sodium diets have been somewhat effective in reducing heart size in dogs with heart failure. But low sodium diets also can lead to electrolyte abnormalities such as alterations in potassium. Um, and they also have been shown repeatedly to stimulate the RAS system earlier and more severely compared to either a normal or a high sodium diet. That's physiology, what's wrong with that? Well, the problem is that the RAS system, while it's an important normal part of physiology, is not necessarily benign. So if we look at some of the effects of angiotensin II, we can see metabolic effects, fibrosis, change. we can see increases in uh, reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress and inflammation and so forth. And that's one of the reasons that Dr. Bonagura was talking about, we treat with ACE inhibitors. We wanna prevent the adverse effects from that. So some of the things that angiotensin can do in terms of other organ systems are you know, fibrosis and stroke and whatnot, but also contribute to myocardial fibrosis, ischemia, and contribute to heart failure. So do we want to restrict sodium if that's gonna cause an increase in the RAS system? Well, there's really been no controlled studies to determine what's the optimum sodium intake level for dogs with heart failure. Several studies have used low sodium intake um, and we're probably too low. So at 0.05 to 0.1% on a dry matter basis, they identified early activation of the RAS system, worsening of clinical scores and oxidative stress, uh, concurrent el electrolyte abnormalities caused by the low sodium, decompensation in some cases, and azotemia um, when used with diuretics or ACE inhibitors. So that level, 13 to 27 milligrams per 100 kcal, I think can be identified as too low, even when you're trying to address, you know, when, you're, when, you, when you do want sodium restriction. What has been acceptable in clinical uh, trials is a, a little bit more, 0.2 to 0.25% on a dry matter basis. But even in that range, 40 to 70 milligrams per 100 kcal, you see an, uh, a stimulation of the RAS system, but no clinical adverse effects, even when used with diuretics. So when we over restrict sodium, there have been studies on the human side that show increased mortality. Um, so there's actually controversy now on the human side, despite decades of saying we need to restrict sodium. There, there's newer evidence and newer evidence and meta-analysis and the Haynes study and so forth that calls into question 
if sodium should be restricted, for whom and for how much? In dogs, that question is also true. When and how much or even if? Even the ACBIM consensus group that recommends sodium restriction admits there's very little evidence to support their recommendation. So we know that in dogs, sodium at 22 to 62 milligrams per 100 kcal stimulates the RAS system. There is really limited data that shows a benefit to sodium restriction. The current recommendation, which is 50 to 100 milligrams per 100 kcal, depending on severity of the disease, that, that is the current recommendation, but it is not based on, on good scientific evidence. So what I'm trying to tell you is that there's an opportunity um, to do some research because we really don't know if sodium restriction is beneficial to dogs, what level of sodium restriction would be appropriate, what level of sodium is too much. And so you're thinking, here's an opportunity for my resident to do a project. Simple. But before you jump down the rabbit hole and study in sodium, I wanna point out that one of the reasons there is controversy in terms of sodium is because there's so many interactive factors. When we talk about sodium, we're really talking about sodium chloride. And then you have to consider what are the effects of chloride versus the effects of sodium. So there's been studies done with alternative forms of sodium, such as sodium bicarbonate and sodium citrate, and they don't have the same adverse effects as sodium chloride. So, oh, well, chloride's bad. But then you use potassium chloride and you get very different effects. And these different, you know, the, the bicarbonates and so forth also have an influence on acid base, which is gonna influence the RAS system. Bottom line is it's not simple and clean, but there is research that absolutely needs to be done. At this point in time, I would say that um, there really is weak evidence of a benefit to sodium restriction from the levels found even in normal maintenance diets. That doesn't mean that high sodium treats should be fed, mind you, but I'm just saying that, um, that the, the evidence supporting sodium restriction is, is quite weak. The other thing that the uh, consensus statement talks about is cachexia and heart disease, and this is a common complication. Uh, ha having occurring frequently in dogs with congestive heart failure. The definition of cachexia is the loss of muscle mass from disease. So that differs from sarcopenia that we talked about yesterday because sarcopenia is an age-related loss of lean body mass. Sarcopenia occurs very slowly over an extended period of time. Cachexia can occur quite quickly in the face of disease. It may or may not be associated with loss of fat mass um, there's a lot of research going on in both sarcopenia and cachexia, um, but the, the specific causes are still not well defined, but it is associated with poor intake, increased energy needs, which we do see in these patients because of metabolic changes. Inflammatory mediator seems to be a key uh, factor, um, which also increased protein uh, catabolism. And because of the inflammation, it may be that omega-3 fatty acids may be beneficial uh, in the management of cardiac cachexia. So we know that omega-3 fatty acids, and here I'm specifically talking about the long chain poof as the, the uh, dicosapentaenoic acid, it's supposed to be EPA, not DHA. Um, and um, anyway, D EPA and DHA, so the, one, the long chain fatty acids from fish oil are known to have anti-inflammatory effects because of their role as a precursor for the anti-inflammatory eicosanoids. They lead to reduction in vasoconstriction, decreased platelet aggregation, decreased, uh, I'm sorry, decreased chemotaxis, less inflammatory mediators such as TNF-alpha, interleukins-6, uh, NF-kappa-beta, and so forth. They also, in some studies, uh, the use leads to a reduction in free radicals um, so less oxidative stress. And we do also know that inhibition of protein catabolism and anorexia can occur in some models that are, that are supplemented with the omega-3 fatty acids. And that, again, may be related to 
the uh, inflammatory aspects. Not a lot of data in dogs, but uh, this, this study from Lisa Freeman showed that dogs treated with one gram of fish oil, which is about um, one third uh, omega, uh, EPA and DHA, um, so one gram of fish oil per 10 kilogram body weight decreased the inflammatory uh, leukotriene IL-1 and PGE-2 and also reduced the cachexia, reduced the, the muscle mass loss. And in her study, the lower IL-1 was correlated with increased survival. So there does seem to be some support for using the omega-3 fatty acids as management for cardiac cachexia. The other piece of management there is making sure as much as possible that these animals have adequate calories and protein to eat. What is adequate protein for a senior dog with heart failure? We don't know. We know that this cachexia can be occurring on top of the normal age-related sarcopenia, so we're dealing with two things attacking the muscle mass at once. Um, we do know that while increasing protein intake is not going to prevent these things from happening, we know that inadequate protein intake is going to make it worse. So maintaining adequate protein intake is important. What we don't have is data that says what's the amount of protein that's appropriate. This recommendation on this uh, screen is 25% of calories from good quality protein. That's a recommendation made by Tony Buffington decades ago, and I don't even know what the basis for the recommendation is. I do know that the amount of protein needed to maintain protein stores and um, lean body mass is at least threefold more than is needed to maintain nitrogen balance. And nitrogen balance is the basis for defining minimum protein requirements. So as was mentioned yesterday, um, there's enough evidence now in humans to suggest that senior humans need 25 to 40% more protein than younger adults. So I think extrapolating that to dogs until we have more evidence makes sense. Palatability, digestibility, getting these dogs to eat I think is also critically important. If they have um, a congestion, it's not well managed by their medication and so forth, they may have uh, decreases in appetite, they're not feeling well enough to eat. So highly palatable foods, small frequent meals, warming of wet foods, using a highly digestible diet to compensate for potentially decreased blood flow to the gut are all things that might be of value and certainly no harm in pushing for those. But now we need to talk about the evolution. Where have we potentially come? What are the advantages of other nutrients in the management of heart disease? So what I want to share with you is, in one slide, the result of years of research from, um, mostly led by my colleague, Dr. Johnny Lee, and um, with uh, coordination with many others, including John Rush and Lisa Freeman and others. What their studies showed using proteomics and, and uh, metabolomics is that in dogs with mitral valve disease, there is a consistent pattern showing compromised mitochondrial function. The, the, the hundreds of, of uh, metabolites that are different, the hundreds of transcripts that are different consistently show compromises in cardiac energy metabolism, altered fat metabolism, increased oxidative stress and increased inflammation that occurs very early in mitral valve disease and progressively worsens as the disease worsens to uh, end stage heart failure. An interesting observation is that has shown up consistently also is that dogs with mitral valve disease have a decrease in blood levels of methionine and deoxycarnitine. So based on those changes, I propose that different nutrients may be important in the management of dogs with heart failure, specifically an alternative energy source to compensate for changes in fat metabolism, um, magnesium, 
antioxidants, anti-inflammatory nutrients, specifically the omega-3 fatty acids, taurine and carnitine or its precursors. So I'm gonna take the next few minutes to kind of talk through the evidence for each of these nutrient categories. The heart, as you can imagine, requires a lot of energy. It is pumping you know, 50 to 100 times a minute. Every minute of every day, it uses ATP. It needs a lot. It doesn't have a, a, a reservoir of ATP. It's got to produce it as it goes. Um, and so it needs a lot. And most of that, somewhere between 75 and 90% of that ATP comes from the oxidation of fatty acids. Okay, so that's the primary source of ATP energy for the heart, which is great because um, I'm going I'm I'm to jump to the next slide for the next point, but the heart can adapt. So it's using fatty acids for its primary energy source, but it can use other sources. For example, ketones, glucose, amino acids, and lactate. So it has the option to use other sources but under normal circumstances, a healthy heart predominantly using fatty acids. The downside to that, the upside to that, let's start with the upside. The upside to that is fatty acids can yield a lot of ATP. So an 18 carbon fatty acid can yield about 120 molecules of ATP compared to about 32 for glucose and about 22 for ketones. That's the upside. The downside is that oxidation of fatty acids uses up more oxygen per ATP than the other sources. If oxygen, oxygenation, is limited for any reason, whether it be blood flow, whether it be compromised uh, intermediates, whatever it might be, um, this actually is detrimental. And so in the face of heart failure, fatty acid oxidation becomes less efficient and more difficult, and the heart starts to shift away from fatty acids and oxidizing as much as possible ketones and glucose and others, which yield less ATP. And in the end, the failing heart has about 30 to 40% less ATP available to it. So, one of the things that we're looking for is a way to compromise or, or compensate for that. Medium chain triglycerides are an alternative energy source. Now medium chain triglycerides are most commonly found in coconut oil, palm oil, or in milk fats, but, but mostly coconut oil and, and palm oil. Although medium chain triglycerides are carbons from six carbon, or fatty acids from six carbons long up to 12 carbons long, the length of the chain influences how it's metabolized and how it's used. And for all effective purposes, I'm referring to carbons um, octanoate and decanoate with eight or 10 uh, carbon, th these fatty acids. The 12 carbon lauric acid is metabolized almost like a hybrid between the MCTs and the long chains, and it has very different effects um, in the body and in the heart compared to the eights and tens. So when I talk about MCT oil and I'm talking about MCTs, I'm referring to eight and 10 carbons specifically. These fatty acids are very readily absorbed. They're water soluble, they're easily oxidized. They can cross the inner mitochondrial membrane without a carnitine or rate limiting transporter. Um, they also can uh, provide a, a pretty good source of ketones that also can uh, be used as an energy source. So they're a great alternative. In uh, humans and in rodents, um, studies using the MCT supplementation have shown a two to six fold increase in acetyl CoA at the my myocardia. Um, there's an increase actually in beta oxidation of fatty acids, an increase in ATP, ADP ratio, and that's probably the key measure we're looking for. Also a reduction in free radical production and functionally an increase in contractile function in a hypertrophic cardiac disease model. 
As I mentioned, the medium chain fatty acids are also a source of ketones, and ketones can be used by the heart, and it's based on concentration. The more that's in the bloodstream, the more that can be taken up by the heart, and then this can be also oxidized to produce ATP. So alternative energy, magnesium. Magnesium is a macronutrient that probably doesn't get, sorry, not a macronutrient, a macro mineral that doesn't get the attention it deserves in part because diagnosis of magnesium deficiencies are very difficult simply because it is predominantly an intracellular mineral and so what's in the bloodstream does not necessarily reflect the body stores. So if you do measure low magnesium in the bloodstream, you know that animal is very much depleted, but if it's normal, that really doesn't tell you anything. Um, in humans, low magnesium intake or low serum magnesium have both been associated with a greater risk for cardiovascular disease and mortality. Um, even in dogs, uh, and the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel has shown a, an association between low magnesium and um, mitral valve prolapse and, and calcification on the human side. So we know that there's some association between low magnesium intake and cardiovascular disease in humans and dogs. We also know magnesium is pretty well studied and the effects are pretty well known. And of the many, many functions of magnesium in the body, there's a number that are important to the heart function. For example, um, because of that exchange of magnesium for calcium, it has a role in modulating muscle tone and influencing blood pressure. Um, it has a very strong antiarrhythmic effect and that's been shown in dogs as well as other uh, species. It can have an anti-ischemic effect, so helping to protect from the injury of ischemia and that's done through calcium antagonism. Because of its effect on metabolism, it can actually lead to a decrease in free radical formation and therefore a reduction in oxidative damage. It has been shown to decrease inflammatory mediators and also enhances mitochondrial function, which is one of the key reasons we think it might be important in dogs with mitral valve disease that show a defective mitochondrial function. Oops. Okay. Talking about free radicals on a couple of other slides. So what exactly are free radicals? Re free radicals are singlet oxygen or other unpaired electrons. So they are unstable. Um, and so they're looking to be paired up as electrons to stabilize. Um, and in that unstable form, they can cause a lot of damage. We have to remember that free radicals, reactive oxygen species, are a normal byproduct of normal metabolism. So they're being produced through energy metabolism and other things all the time, but the body has lots of ways through um, antioxidants to address those. Um, antioxidants can include um, compounds such as vitamin E, vitamin C, also glutathione and enzymes such as superoxide dysbutase. The way these work is they take those free radicals and they um, add um, electrolytes, uh, electrons to them to make them progressively less reactive. Um, so as long as there's enough antioxidants to compensate for the free radicals there, then there is no oxidative stress. It's just a normal balance. But when you have a lack of antioxidants or when free radical production increases for whatever reason, you can get oxidative stress. And in the face of mitochondrial dysfunction, such as occurs in heart disease, you have an increase in free radical production. And so we see from the uh, metabolomics data, as well as other studies in dogs and in humans, that oxidative stress is a common component in heart failure. Some of the adverse effects from oxidative stress 
are um, myocardial hypertrophy, matrix remodeling, cellular necrosis and apoptosis. Uh, it can interfere with nitric, nitric oxide availability and that can then lead to hypertension. It can uh, alter uh, calcium handling, uh, influencing arrhythmia. It can contribute to ischemic infarcts. Lots of adverse effects in terms of the, the cardiovascular system. What's interesting is that there's some evidence that, well, there's actually quite a bit of, of like preclinical studies on the human side and, and rodent side where um, there, there's strong evidence that oxidative stress is damaging, but when you try to treat that by giving antioxidants such as vitamin B or, or any of the, the various uh, antioxidants that have been treated by vitamin E, um, the, this, the studies don't show a benefit to giving large amounts of antioxidants through the diet. So it has been suggested that the better protection would be finding ways to encourage endogenous production of, of the natural antioxidants. So um, in other words, giving precursor antioxidants. But the, the dietary antioxidants that we often think about are the, the vitamins such as E, A, C, polyphenols and flavonoids, um, but then there's the precursor antioxidants that can be produced uh, within the body. So sulfur amino acids are a precursor for a number of these. So we're talking about here methionine, cysteine, SAMe, and acetylcholine, um, and, uh, and acetylcysteine, the amino acids lysine and arginine, as well as the, the minerals, magnesium, and the trace minerals, copper, zinc, and, and selenium, all contribute to the formation of, of natural antioxidants. The other thing that can be beneficial to reduce free radicals is uh, supporting mitochondrial function, which can then reduce the production of the free radicals in the first place. So for that, we're looking at magnesium, alternative energy sources such as MCTs, taurine, which amongst other things serves as an antioxidant, and, and carnitine to facilitate normal metabolism. We already talked about omega-3 fatty acids in terms of cachexia, but in addition to that role, it has a benefit in terms of just cardiovascular function. Uh, so some of the benefits from the omega-3 fatty acids that, that may be valuable include the, certainly the uh, anti-inflammatory effect, so a reduction in, in, in inflammatory uh, prostaglandins, a reduction in thromboxanes, uh, and a reduction in the inflammatory cytokines, reduction in thrombosis, a reduction in blood pressure, reduced risk for arrhythmias, as well as, as we already talked about, reduction in cachexia. Taurine, just mentioned that a few minutes ago because it does have a role as an antioxidant, but it has many other roles in the body. So of course, taurine is an amino acid, but it's a beta amino acid. It's not incorporated into proteins. It serves as a sort of a standalone uh, protein or, or, or amino acid in the body. Um, it is found in high concentrations in skeletal muscle, including heart muscle and it has a, new, a number of functions. Um, within the heart muscle, the primary function is maintenance of contractile function. Um, it also contributes to osmoregulation. Um, it contributes to mitochondrial function, which then leads to uh, ATP support and um, reduction in free radical production. Therefore, it has its antioxidant properties. Taurine, as you recall, is produced endogenously from um, methionine as a sulfur amino acid. And in most dogs, um, taurine is not needed in the diet because dogs are able to produce adequate taurine as long as the sulfur amino acids are adequate. That said, there are exceptions. And we do know that there's an association between taurine deficiency and dilated cardiomyopathy that occurs in cats and appears to occur in some limited number of dogs. Um, and so taurine is important for heart health. 
Now, carnitine is another nutrient that is normally produced by the body from methionine as well as lysine. Um, and carnitine has a number of functions in the body, but the one that's of most importance to heart function is the fact that it is a uh, essential transporter. So it serves to transport fatty acids across the inner mitochondrial membrane, which allows them to be oxidized to produce ATP. Since the heart is dependent on those fatty acids normally for its ATP, it is dependent on carnitine. So obviously we need carnitine in the body and there is um, some evidence. Let's start with the human side first. There's some evidence that supplementation is beneficial in, in problems such as ventricular arrhythmias and other cardiovascular diseases such as thrombosis, emboli, angina, and reperfusion injury. On the dogs, We've been supplementing dogs with heart failure with carnitine for, for many years, but the evidence to support a need is actually very limited. Um, there were a number of studies, it was Bruce Keene's work, uh, working with boxer dogs and showing that in those few dogs initially, supplementation with carnitine actually reversed um, the disease, if I remember correctly, or at least clinically reversed it. Then when he took them off the supplementation, they got worse, put them back on, they got better. It's pretty convincing that in those dogs there was a benefit from carnitine supplementation. But how widespread that carnitine supplementation would be is questionable. We have recognized from the data that myocardial deficiency of carnitine is fairly common with certain forms of heart failure. But despite the myocardial deficiency, plasma levels in these patients has been normal or even elevated. And so it seems that the challenge is not um, making carnitine or obtaining carnitine. The challenge seems to be getting carnitine into the body, into the, into the heart tissue. So we'll talk about that in just a moment, but I wanna point out the other study that was done with carnitine supplementation was done in conjunction with taurine supplementation. So those boxer, uh, the sorry, boxer dogs, the Cocker Spaniels were treated with taurine plus carnitine. And yes, there was a benefit, but how much impact was carnitine and how much was taurine we really have no way of knowing. So I guess I'm not gonna show you about the deoxycarnitine, but I wanna to talk to you about it because um, the heart as, as, let me go back there. Yeah. So as, as dependent as the heart is for carnitine and getting fatty acids into the mitochondria, as, de as, as, as dependent as it is, the heart can't produce carnitine. It produces deoxycarnitine. And then it exchanges the deoxycarnitine for carnitine from the bloodstream. So it, it, it needs to get that, that, that carnitine from the bloodstream. So if that exchange is compromised, that can lead to a myocardial deficiency of carnitine regardless of what's circulating in the bloodstream or what's in the diet. So, um, so why not put carnitine in the diet? Okay, maybe they don't need it, but maybe some do. So what's the downside to putting it into the food? Well, there is emerging evidence these days that um, in humans and in rodents and in dogs, um, there is an association, and I'm focusing on association because there's no cause versus effect known yet, but there is an association between TMAO and progression of heart disease. So TMAO, um, so, so carnitine in the diet can be broken down to trimethylamine by the microflora in the gut. That is then taken up to the liver 
where it is converted to TMAO. So this metabolite is circulating in the bloodstream in higher quantities in dogs with heart failure. There's also concurrent with that, we, we have seen a, a relative increase in carnitine. So in other words, in patients with heart failure, bloodstream carnitine and bloodstream TMAO are both elevated. So supplementing with carnitine doesn't seem like it's going to be beneficial because the challenge is getting it into the heart. So in humans, supplemental carnitine will actually cause an increase in TMA in the circulation. And that is associated, not, not the supplementation is not associated with it, but the circulating TMAO is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. So it raises questions is really what I want to point out. It raises questions, okay? The other piece of this puzzle is that consistently we've seen now that dogs with mitral valve disease have low levels of circulating methionine. Methionine, of course, is a precursor for carnitine as well as for taurine, as well as um, numerous other functions of methionine in the body. So it kind of makes sense to me that instead of putting carnitine into the diet that can be broken down to result in TMAO, that instead you provide the precursors, methionine and lysine, because this has been shown, um, at least in, in chickens, to be just as effective as a way to get the carnitine up um, without causing an increase in TMAO. Okay, so I've talked about a lot of nutrients. What I wanna point out here in summary is when and where they might be of value. So we've got two different categories. We've got that early stage mitral valve disease where we've seen some of these metabolic changes occurring and then we have congestive heart failure. Can you feed one diet to all of them and provide a benefit? Well, moderate sodium restriction in the face of congestive heart failure, even though the evidence isn't really there to support it, there's also no evidence that as long as you don't over restrict, there's no evidence of an adverse effect. So a moderate sodium restriction is certainly an acceptable uh, thing to do in congestive heart failure and avoiding excessive. In early stage mitral valve disease, there's probably no benefit to that. Energy sources to support the heart. We know that there are changes in mitochondrial function and, and uh, cardiac energy metabolism that occurs early and gets worse as the disease progresses. So finding alternative energy sources makes a lot of sense. We know that Carnitine at the level of the heart is important. So finding uh, sources to get to supplement that are important. And so carnitine precursors can do that without increasing the TMAO levels. Taurine to support heart function. We don't really know when it's needed and when it's not. There's no known adverse effects to taurine supplementation. So I'm gonna say that's one I would vote to include at any stage for heart function. Magnesium is critical to heart function. I think there's a lot of research that needs to be done in terms of identifying when, how much, how important exactly how to supplement it and so forth. But at this point in time, I think it's critically important to include it. The anti-inflammatory nutrients, the antioxidants, I think the evidence shows that they're needed even early on and the benefit in, in, in congestive heart failure is, um, is also supported by that metabolomics data. Uh, and certainly it makes sense to feed the right amount of calories to maintain ideal body condition, um, maintaining protein to avoid sarcopenia and cachexia as much as possible are probably critically important. Um, so I will say one thing to all the nutritionists in the room and, and, and online. I haven't given you any doses. You know, what good is telling you restrict sodium or give more of this or give less of that when we don't know what the baseline is? But the reality is there's, I'm sorry, there's a lot more research that's needed to tease out if there are optimum doses and what those doses would be.
but we know that there's all these nutrients that have an important role to play in heart health. And with that, I actually have a few minutes early, but I'm, I'm done and thank you very much for your attention.